And so, Gnosis and the Four Pillars, as we said, that the foundation, just like a foundation of a structure with four pillars, the foundation of a civilization, the foundation of a culture, throughout time, is founded on these these four pillars. And you can find them if you search historical records or archaeological sites or Google on the Internet, though it may not be expressed this way. Those four pillars are art, philosophy, science, and mysticism, or religion. We tend to not use the religion word because it's got some negative connotations, but um, but religion is really the correct word because what religion actually means is it comes from the Latin religare, which means re, again, and ligare, or um, like ligament, to unite. So what religion is, it, it is a means to which unite again, to connect us as souls, as essences, with, with our source. And so we're going to conclude with that tonight. That pillar, as it is, and we last week spoke about the pillar of art and philosophy, and tonight we're going to look at the, the two pillars of science and religion. And right off the bat, we probably think, wow, what, what contrasting articles, science and religion. But in the ancient times and in much of our modern times, not over the last few years, but science and religion were directly connected, just like art and philosophy. And maybe we're going to ask of a change of perspective or a reflection into how societies form, but how these ideas have become concepts and how they've become not just concepts in the world, but concepts inside of ourself. And Gnosis being the element that transforms facilitates the breaking of concepts because a concept is an idea that becomes trapped in time. And all of these ideas that become trapped in time aren't allowed to breathe, to live, to transform, to change. And in that, by that, it essentially dies. So every concept we have in the, our minds or that we build our identity or reality around that isn't being tested, looked at, or more importantly, comprehended, it becomes a trap. And this is not just with these great ideas, it's, it becomes traps for our own psyche. Believing I am good or bad, believing um, I'm progressive or conservative, having beliefs that aren't actively being experienced. And this comes to the core of, of tonight's talk, which is in relation to science or the scientific method. And we're going to, to I am going to share some, some reflections, not to really to criticize as much as to cause us to reflect on our concepts of how our civilization is, because we, we've all heard the frog and the hot water analogy. I don't know who's actually doing that, putting frogs in hot water, but I'll take a stand right now and say you should stop doing that. Walter? <laughs> is, he, is he doing that? I don't know. Have you ever done that? Okay, Maybe. No. Anyway, but we're, we're familiar. You put the frog in the water and slowly the water gets warmer, warmer, warmer until... And the, we are all, in, in essence, that. We have very memories. And the memories that we have you know, of our lifetime or, that, or are on concepts that have been given to us that we've never actually submitted to the scientific method. And Gnosis has a really um, specific way of, of utilizing the scientific method because it takes into account what we call the consciousness. 
And the consciousness in a big sense, but the consciousness as an intimate sense, you, I, we, our consciousness, is fundamentally essential to know anything. And so much of the time that we, we, we take in information and we think, oh, I know that, I know that, but we don't really allow the consciousness to be touched by the information. And we take it as given. And science is one of those constructs that we feel so satisfied with as it is to say things like the science, I follow the science, and and it's like it's done. It's a concept that's already been decided. Or I, you know, my, I, I look to my doctor to tell me if I'm healthy instead of actually taking into account how we actually feel. And, and that our health is actually in our own hands fundamentally. We put so much faith and trust in institutions outside of ourselves. And that is not very scientific, really. Because the most important element in knowing anything in our life is centered around us, our self, our self-awareness and our attention. And so that when we talk about science and religion... We could say that another way of looking at it is how we've become a science of a religion or a religion of science. Because both of those things come into play in the way that we're here so that we have negative or positive associations with either of those words or um means of philosophy, living our lives, without actually really knowing where the data comes from, what is the purpose of the data, how was it taken in, and why was it taken in. And, and unfortunately, in a society like we live in, that's so centered around money, everything has to do with money, when we say follow the science, often what we're doing is following the money because the, the science and the findings are usually being sponsored by certain ideals, which leads us to an element of confusion, which is this relationship of, of the observer effect, which would be who and why are we conducting an experiment and for what means and what reason is it happening? And then it's published or put on the internet and it's accepted. It's accepted as truth. And many of these truths that say this was proven or disproven, and when you dig deeper, it goes around and around and generally to one or two points of view that keep getting repeated over and over and over. And we never actually really get to the core of what's going on. Now, that takes us back to how we pay attention, because that's a, a fundamental element of a bigger uh, way of perceiving. So that's where our practice is going to begin right now. And Gnosis tells us that it's very important for us to know how we're paying attention. And Gnosis tells us something very interesting. We believe, you know, we're in this three-dimensional space of height, width, and depth, right? Three dimensions. And that we have faculties in our senses to perceive the three dimensions, but we also have faculties in, in our perception of the intellect and the mind, the emotional capacity, in relation to those physical senses. And Gnosis tells us if we're not aware and the perception in the mind, as well as the representation and the elements, the emotions, along with the sensorial data that comes in through the senses, we're actually not perceiving three dimensions. We're actually lessening our capacity to know truth. 
So in order for this to take place, fundamentally, we have to divide our attention. And in dividing our attention, our awareness expands into what we call the consciousness, which is the consciousness of awareness, the consciousness of attention, to be conscious of what we're perceiving. And if I said, as I said, that we need those three faculties and we need consciousness in those three faculties to really perceive the three dimensions as they are, then consciousness is completely essential to really know anything. And in that, knowing anything, that prime element is me as the observer, my consciousness. And you see right off the bat how much we've put in faith and reliance on other people's consciousness, other people's observances, other people's truth. Think of this for a moment. Pause and think. How much of our life, how much of our experience, how much of our information and knowledge that we hold as, as truth have we actually intimately experienced for ourselves, comprehended? Gnosis, like many of the ancient teachings, tell us that the consciousness has the capacity to not only experience these three dimensions, but the fourth dimension or the energy or the time with which anything in this physical reality has been placed into movement. The consciousness also has the ability to perceive the fifth dimension, which has an eternal relationship. The consciousness actually can experience beyond the fifth dimension in the sixth and seventh dimensions. And in reality, anything that's taking place in this physical plane has seven fundamental dimensions associated with it. And so you see, if we just focus on our senses, which only perceive this tactile, visual, auditor, three-dimensional space, we've really diminished our capacity to really know what's taking place. And that's why in ancient times, religion and science were linked together. We'll go deeper into this, but let's get to the practice, to the practice of dividing our attention into three. So the first is to feel ourselves in our senses, feel ourselves as ourself. Any posture that we're in, Notice the sensations. We could maybe put our attention in our feet as they are contacting the ground, or in our feet as they're contacting our socks or our shoes. And we can do this without thinking about it. We can feel it. And our legs and the clothing that touches our legs the cushion or the chair that we're seated on, our shirt as it contacts the skin. We might notice, as we had the door open a little earlier, a little coldness touching the, the hair, maybe a little wind. And with this, we can also notice tension or relaxation in the physical body. And throughout this practice, it's good to, when we notice the tension that we may have not noticed initially, relax, relax it. Let our shoulders relax. Let our forehead relax. Let us, with our imagination, have an imprint of the entirety of our body. not focused on one elbow as it touches the chair or one foot as it touches the ground. But when our attention goes to a sensation, to one limb or one finger or one sound, when we notice that, 
relax and expand out beyond that so that we are feeling the totality of both arms, both legs, our torso. If we are moving, we want to be aware of our motion, of our movement. So I think it's safe to say here, now, this is the awareness of you. The sensation of you. You as the subject. We don't have to think, name, or even see to perceive ourselves as ourselves. Now, of course, beyond this physical body, there's emotions, there's thoughts. And we may notice when we have a thought, our mind bounces up into the head, and then a sensation and our attention moves to the sensation. And this takes a level of effort to be completely in our bodies, completely aware of ourself being ourself. And if we have an itch, you're free to scratch it, free to move. But in it, the motion, let's be aware of ourself as we're moving, as well as being aware of why we're moving and aware of ourselves when we stop moving. A tool that's being used often to stay in the body, to stay in the present moment, is the breath, the breathing. Because that's something we're absolutely doing. We may notice also our heart beating. We may notice, I've never noticed my heart beat before. But again, if you don't notice your heartbeat, then don't worry about it. I'm pretty sure it's beating. And fortunately, the heart beats without our awareness. Isn't that a great a gift. mechanism of this physical body that the, the heartbeat and the breathing take place without us having to think about it? Otherwise, we'd be in big trouble. Remembering totality in our awareness of our body, our self as the subject. Now, it may be helpful to close our eyes to do this, but it's not necessary because in, in the end, the objective is to maintain this awareness while doing anything. This key right here, being aware of our physical body, This we could call gnosis now. The knowledge, gnosis means knowledge, but the knowledge of direct experience, the direct experience of ourself now. And yes, I'm talking, we're not relaxing completely, because it gives you the opportunity to keep noticing when your attention moves away and to return to the body, to the awareness of yourself. Being yourself. That this key right here, being present in your physical body and as relaxed as possible, meaning only as tense as you need to be to carry out a motion, a movement. Oddly enough, anything that we do without consciousness. In Gnosis, we consider that to be a dream, a mechanical playing out of circumstances without awareness. Sometimes we pace without consciousness and we're, fit, we're dreaming in the physical body. Sometimes we're tapping fingers or we're 
searching our phone. And we often do these things without real awareness. We do it habitually, mechanically, which is what we say is a dream in the physical body. And the reason, if you've heard of teachings that talk about conscious out-of-body experiences, the reason that we don't have easily accessible conscious out-of-body experiences is because generally we don't have conscious in-body experiences, at least not with enough consistency and continuity. Because we continually move from mechanical movement to mechanical movement, reaction, tension in the body. So, in this, we don't notice that often when carrying out an action, depending on what our job is, whether it's at a computer or working with tools, we don't notice that we're actually using much more energy by mechanically doing things, extra tension in our muscles, than is necessary to carry out the task that we're doing. So this key right here can add not only to our health and well-being, but to our peace of mind. And it's very simple to be present, to be focused on ourself and what we're doing. Now, the second component, remember we were going to divide our attention into three, create a trinity of the human being that is you. Our, our first is the subject, ourself. The second is the object or the objective. What it is in this moment that I'm doing. So I'm aware of myself being myself. And then I have attention onto the thing that I'm actually doing. So in this case, if I'm looking at the computer screen, that's the objective. And I can imagine that I have an arrow of attention coming from my eyes towards the screen. And an arrow back shining upon myself, being myself. Myself is the subject, what I'm doing is the object. Now in that it also includes objects in general. If I were to have a cup in my hand. Now this may sound basic, like, hey Jeff, come on, let's, don't treat me like a child. Well, actually, children do this naturally. <laughs> So we're not even children, really, when it comes to this. That's why in, in, in the Gospels, Jesus said that in order to see the kingdom, we need to be like a child. The child is totally in the moment. We have grandkids, yes, multiple grandkids. And as they learn to talk, you notice they say what they're doing, what they're pointing at. They're completely in the moment. They're aware of the object or what they're doing and their selves as they're doing it. It's a natural capacity. So the object is also listening. You can imagine that there's an arrow going towards or outward towards sound and point it back onto yourself as the hearer, the hearer's journey is that we're on. <laughs> so our ears are always listening. Our eyes are always seeing. But how often are we aware that we're looking at something? Now, this is a concept to break right off the bat because we might think, oh, yeah, I know I'm, when I'm looking at something. But here's something very interesting to, to note, that knowing in that way that I just used it, is passive. 
I know I'm seated on a chair, which is different than being observant, to observe myself sitting on a chair. And actually, it's a couch. So we're aware of ourself as the subject and the object, what I'm doing in here. And we can carry this through the rest of the class and actually through every class. This should be the, the reminder. This is where we begin. And I will remind us generally to begin with this. This is a thought-free zone. We don't have to, to think. And it's actually a misconception that I need to think to learn. It's actually the opposite. Thinking gets in the way of learning. And even trying to solve problems, thinking is a logical step that goes from A to B. But as Einstein said, logic can take you from A to B. Imagination can take you anywhere. And we, we hold that to be absolutely true. Because as we talk about conscious out-of-body experience, it's to use the imagination to go anywhere. The consciousness, as I said, is bigger than this body. The potential is greater. We limit it to this body, to these senses, because we're not aware of what it is that we're doing and not consistently aware of what we're doing. So now, by being aware of myself as the subject and attentive to the object or objects that I'm using, we've now not only aided in the physical health and the, and the conservation of energy of being me, I've actually added to the mental peace and stability. Just like, in, here's another concept that might be broken, maybe. If it takes energy to move a finger, to tense a muscle, to lift a piano, we can all, I'm trying to make it so that we all understand that, right? It takes physical energy to do that. It takes mental energy to think a thought. You may have noticed some days when you don't do physical work, but you're thinking a lot and you get exhausted. So in that, let's imagine, let's imagine, for, for instance, we only have 3,488,000 movements in this physical body. Give or take a million. By limiting how much we move and how tense we do it, how consciously we, we interact, we're actually extending the life of the physical body. Now in these times, the physical body is, a, is, a, is a, a big part, but the mind and the mental capacity, if we apply that same understanding to a certain amount of thoughts or mental energy that we have that needs to be recuperated each day by the consciousness disengaging from the physical, emotional, and mental bodies, but if we're unconsciously processing the consciousness doesn't get to disengage from the mind or the emotions. So we're always thinking. It's a blessing and a curse to always be thinking. And we notice when we come to a teaching like this that asks us at certain points to stop thinking, we realize what a habit it is. And we know that along with physical ailments throughout time of a life, Mental capacities diminish. Memory goes away. That is one of the known things that happens. 
And we could look at our parents or our grandparents or many other examples of minds that have been lost. Control of the, of the mind is, is lost. So by putting our attention solely in the present moment of what we're doing, it doesn't mean thoughts aren't going to come. But we don't lose our attention and think them mechanically because every thought is taking mental energy. Now, we've divided our attention into two. Subject, object. Now to expand in depth into the third dimension, we need to use what's known as the spatial sense and to perceive subject, object, and our location. Peripheral awareness of where we are at every moment is optimal. Attention with awareness, and the awareness begins on myself, but extends beyond, because obviously, to live a healthy, happy life, we need some spatial awareness. We need some peripheral vision, as our grandchildren show us. Yes, they live in the moment, but sometimes they don't uh, keep that peripheral vision open, mm -hmm. and they run into things often because they get very excited, because this relates very much with emotional energy or emotional compa um, capacity, expansion. So to fill this space of location is to fill it with inspiration, which we talked about a lot last week. Having an uplifted heart as we're doing what we're doing. We're aware of our surroundings as if we're in a magical place. Now that's not absolutely necessary, but it's absolutely helpful. Because this puts us in the state to continue the scientific method and perceive life as it is. Because obviously, we can just, in this example of this attention style right now, we notice if, for instance, a mosquito bit me and, ah, my attention goes down there, for a moment I lose awareness of everything else. Or something happens and grabs my attention outside of myself, the body tenses up and I lose attention of myself. Sometimes I'm in my mind, we all are sometimes, and I'm thinking, 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 and I'm completely unaware of my surroundings. And we run into something in the car, or on our feet, or we forget where we put our keys, for instance. If we were able to maintain this awareness all of the time, we would never lose anything. Because... I'm aware that I have an object in my hand, and I'm aware of myself as I put the object down in the location of the surroundings that I put it in. Subject, object, location. We call it the practice of, of soul, or S-O-L. Subject, object, location. Imagine, again, the power of never losing anything. Or never forgetting anything. And please, I'm not saying that I never lose anything or I never forget anything. But if we could maintain this continuity of consciousness, which is what's required to fill this space with our awareness, it's, it's consciousness. Which means a thought comes and another thought, but I don't become the thought. I don't identify with the thought. Meaning, I don't lose my awareness of myself to think. So you can see this practical teaching already helps you from losing your keys, 
helps you to remember things because when you have an imprint of what you see when you do it or where you are when you think it, it adds just like the, the, the tool of writing something down and being aware of it. How often have we written something down to remember something and then when I needed to remember it, I didn't even have to go look, but I wrote it down. The act of doing with attention helps me to remember. You know, earlier Jeffrey was talking about how the, the consciousness, when it's, when it's present, has a capacity, I mean, first and foremost, like let's step up to the level of even just being aware of the third dimension. Because like if you say we're running into things, you know, often we're not even aware of the basic third dimension. But it can help us to expand and perceive at subtler levels. And you talked about the fourth dimension and, you know, the fourth dimension is the energetic aspect of things. So when you hear of like an aura or you know, some people can perceive that and they're perceiving the fourth dimensional aspect of a three dimensional um, person or, or thing. And we were talking about this with, with some other students last night, how the the quality of filling the space or being aware of the space that Jeffrey's talking about related with inspiration or in other words um what we call a gnosis superior emotion or or higher emotion or, or just an elevated state which is really the the reality of things that that creation is born ultimately of love and mercy you know that really the the true purest reality of things is an elevated state and and if you spend time quiet or um attuned to nature you begin to to realize that you can know that 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 things in their really natural essence are in a state of higher emotion or elevated emotion so it's simply to be more open and aware resonant with like things as they are and, and, and so there's awareness of myself there's awareness of what i'm observing or what i'm doing and then there's awareness of the space around me and how that helps to expand our consciousness it helps us to be more conscious instead of like he's saying kind of fixated onto or drifting away or lost or which is inevitably going to be in the past or the present not this moment so i'm losing consciousness of all that is which is right now and you reminded me that we we talked a little bit about um this mystic joseph of cupertino in the 1600s a christian mystic who if you ever see an an image like the art of joseph of cupertino is usually of him flying because he was known and observed levitating and it was that his his love of the divine was so incredibly powerful that sometimes in prayer he would just cry out and start levitating like he he would make a sound and like like um as the gnostic master samael described it like um dynamite going off you know human dynamite going off he would cry out and he would levitate and it was just that state of superior emotion and and levitation is possible when one is very in touch with the fourth dimension because laws are different in different dimensions in the third dimension we are we are submitted to the law of gravity as it is in the third dimension but it's possible to connect with the fourth dimension in a way that liberates you from certain laws. And that's where you hear of these amazing stories of walking on coals or through fire or levitation. And, and, and this is where we're starting to inch towards science and mysticism and how, how they can integrate actually beautifully and how in their right state, they are very well integrated. Mm -hmm. Because much of, the science of today, the medicine of today, came from individuals that had the capacity of perceiving beyond the third dimension. Which is generally in a state of non-thinking. And not that thinking has no place. Don't take us wrong on that. Thinking absolutely has its proper place. You know, the intellectual brain is 
is amazing and and its capacity of thinking can be very useful um, but just like any tool if you're trying to use it everywhere all the time on everything you're just going to break stuff and the tool and the tool <laughs> i know we've been there <laughs> yeah i can drive a nail with a screwdriver but i could do a lot better with a hammer and the problem is that we rely on certain things and we do them over and over so much so that we forget that we have a hammer or forget how to use a hammer. So this is where we're going to begin. This relationship of self-observation, as it's called. The essence of the scientific method is observation. The essence of Gnostic scientific method begins with self-observation because I am the one that's observing what I'm doing simultaneously with myself. And in this way it starts to take advantage in, of what is known as the observer effect, which some science says, oh, it doesn't really apply to, you know, things beyond the quantum level and it doesn't apply to um, affecting things in the physical reality but as Judith said it actually does it actually does it's just that it tends to not because we don't have that powerful of, of, of observation but we are affecting at the at the quantum level minute elements all of the time and so we'll go into that in a moment but we're going to take a break and we're going to take a break remembering the state that we're in right now, right? Everyone's aware of their body, their movements, their surroundings, right? You see how easy it is to forget? So the key for us is not to, to think, oh, I can't do this, or oh, you know, I'm so unaware. The key is to use the consciousness as a reminder that when I forget to be aware, I just be aware. I take that as a reminder. So much so, and this is a great example of a misuse of the mind. How many times have we beat ourselves up in the mind for not doing what we're supposed to do? Instead of being grateful that I remembered that I was supposed to do something and just do it. Be in the moment. Don't let the mind take you out of the moment for not being in the moment. <laughs> you see, it's absurd, but we live this way. This is the, the I don't know how many great benefits I've already offered, but may imagine to liberate yourself, and this is the truth in the teaching of Gnosis and on the foundation of all true mystical religious teachings is to liberate yourself from suffering because it's possible and suffering first begins in the mind when I think that thought of how bad I did this or did that and if I could just remove that right there I've liberated myself from a, a relative level of suffering now of course, we're not talking about forgetting everything and not paying it, you know, not listening to the little voice, the still small voice. But perceiving a thought, an idea, a sound, an image does not need to be played over and over and over unconsciously. Because really what that's doing, it's taking energy of your consciousness away from your capacity to be present. And if the objective is to be present, then when you realize you're not present, just let that thought go and be present. Any thought that is worth its weight in, will, be, will come again. We don't have to mechanically think things over and over and over again. And the more we start to live with our consciousness this way, we don't have to worry about forgetting things either in the same way. We rely on the consciousness to inform us, to remind us. 
by saying, I'm going to pay attention, subject, object, location, to the thought that comes into my mind. Just like a sensation that I notice, I pull back and feel the entirety of my body. A thought that emerges, I pull back and take it in context of all the presence that I have in the moment. I don't make it the main source or objective at the expense of everything else that's happening. Okay. So we're going to take six until five past till five past. Mm -hmm. But the exercise is to maintain this state of awareness. As we get up, we get a drink, we may talk. Let's go. Okay, so now I'm sure we're all very successfully moving around our homes or places consciously, and now we're present and conscious here and now. And this is, this is the exercise for the week, to do this from now until next week. Or, if, if you forget, then do it maybe a hundred times each day until we get to, to remember, to remember. We call this in Gnosis self-observation. And then the addition of that superior state of inspiration the 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 awe of curiosity the magic of the moment to, to be generally interested and excited in what you're doing because you're doing it so what more should you be interested in but but to feel that excitement is to connect to a, to another level of which we call self-remembering, remembering our self beyond the self that we're observing. So self-observation and a state of self-remembering or remembering the true self, which is the self that we generally are not aware of because we don't have the space or the openness to try to, to experience that. Which brings us to the topic of science and the necessity of understanding the difference between an observed phenomena or observing something outside of yourself, which is better than maybe being told something, obviously, but actually observing it. But observing something outside of ourselves does not have the capacity of transformation in the true sense. It doesn't provide gnosis, which is knowledge of the direct experience. In order for that to take place, we need to be self-observing. We need to be able to make a connection, a comprehension between what I'm perceiving and how I'm receiving it. And in that space, the faculty of intuition allows knowing, real knowing or knowledge to come. And in that way, we, we separate what we believe to be knowledge, which really is in a formation. We see something. All of the knowledge and wisdom that goes into this, which is a stylus, it does magical things. But really, it's just information. It's knowledge in a formation. Every experience that we have in, in our life is really just information. 
And the scientific method is about taking in information data. But it's important to know where that data comes from and that in a moment we're open to receiving all of the possible data in that moment, all of the information, because that allows us to have a complete picture of truth, knowledge, wisdom. And in that way, we, we separate the knowledge from the formation. And we can be transformed because it penetrates inside of ourselves. We're not just finding it outside. We're finding a relationship inside of ourselves. And wisdom, comprehension, intuition comes from the combination of those two elements. So to experience gnosis or the knowledge of direct experience, we need to be aware of ourself, observing ourselves as we're experiencing. And that's how that information is converted into gnosis, wisdom. The third element of that is the ability to apply it. It's not just information, but it's information that I find inside of myself and I know how to apply it. Because to have information, to have a, a teaching, to have a book that's written in a language that I don't understand, I can't apply it. The consciousness is the key to unlocking the language. Everything that we see is a symbol, like we talked about last week in the relationship of art, that everything, every word is a symbol. Every element is a symbol. It represents not just what it is, but what it can do and what it means. So, so we start to open up and find application to the experience that we're having, which allows the capacity for gnosis to be real. It allows the possibility of transformation. So much of the science, the medicine uh, that we have today, and this is just a, a reflection, it's not a condemnation, comes from previous times, previous areas. We have a science that's built on the idea of separating a part from the whole, finding what is the element inside this natural occurring object that has the, the power that I want, I take it out, and then I reproduce it to get an effect, which is the opposite of what we would call this holistic relationship whole foods, like to take an element from a food and then reproduce it, to take an element from a sacred plant such as the coca plant that was been, it's been used for thousands and thousands of years to help people. It has an intelligence unto itself, but finding an element that, that we deem the necessary thing to take it out and then reproduce that element over and over and over. We have a drug. Much of the drugs we have today are founded on natural products that have been used by shaman or doctors that are living beyond the three dimensions that we were talking about. Actually communicating, looking at the quality, the virtue, uh, the power of the plant. It was seen always that one would go to the doctor, the shaman, with a problem, and the shaman would go into the internal worlds, into the superior and inferior dimensions, to communicate to the soul of the person, to communicate to nature and the soul of nature and the souls and the intelligence of the different plants, to come back with what it is. How many times have we heard this? Wow, what it must have been like thousands of years ago, you know? People eating things until they get the right combination. How many people would have died and all of these? You realize that's insanity to even think that that's how we got where we are. 
that people just blindly ate things until they figured out what helps what. Can you imagine? I know we think that, but it's not true. There was a transcendence, a spiritual connection to the elements, where the plant itself communicates not through the third dimension, but through the fourth or fifth dimension to the shaman. Much of the science that we have now came to us in that same way. But what our science does now, it takes the information and says, I want this element and I'm, I don't want this other mumbo jumbo that you believe is mumbo jumbo, which in time, at first, it does facilitate some realm of healing, but it doesn't incorporate the holistic nature, which means it does not incorporate all of the unseen consequences that come with isolating something from its source. Nature provides birth and death in every element. When we cook it, we break it down. When we separate it, we break it down. And we don't allow it to naturally be. Objectively, we would be living consciously, eating when we're hungry. That's a novel idea. Eating when we're hungry eating what we need. For instance, how does a dog know that when its stomach's upset to eat grass? It knows. It has an intuitional element. We used to have that. By putting our attention outside of ourselves, we've lost the capacity to know what we need to be healthy. So then we need doctors or shaman, but it's very interesting in the ancient times, it was known that it's the virtue of the doctor that completely relates to the facilitation of the healing. One might have noticed I had a name up there, Bombastus. One such doctor has the name of Philippus, Areolus, Theoprastus, Bombastus, von Honenheim. Or Paracelsus. The name Paracelsus was a title. Celsus was considered to be a great uh, scientist, and he was para-like or equal to Celsus. He was also called bombastic because he was very bombastic. And he, he, he really battled against the establishments of the time. Him, um, where much of our modern science and ideas come from, he, he understood completely that it's the virtue of the scientist that facilitates. Now, what we call the scientific method means something's not scientifically true until anyone and everyone can perform the same experiment and get the same outcome, which means we reduce everything to the lowest common denominator. In ancient times, it was understood that, that the mystic communicated internally, understood gap. And so it's the virtue because it was understood effect is real. The one that's facilitating the observation affects the outcome. Now, if this is true, imagine this. Hundreds and hundreds of years of, of our modern science observing and pushing in a direction, saying that this is the outcome, this is what we're after, this is what we're after. And if the observer affects the outcome, it's very possible that the science that we believe in now has completely been made up because of our observations pushing, when desire wishes for an outcome, when money pushes and fuels the experiments, it completely affects what we observe. We can notice this in ourselves. Another early doctor by the name of Michel Nostradamus, we've probably heard, we think of him as the, the great seer, but he was a doctor. And he 
believed in this metaphysical concept at the time of the germ. But we weren't able to perceive it. We didn't have the faculty to perceive it. And he was, he was believed to be crazy. And now we know. Now we have the ability to perceive, to take in the data that shows and verifies that germs, viruses, diseases are caused by very small, small particles. But also the knowledge of knowing how to see and who it is that's seen. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Hippocratic Oath. That is the, the, the statement that's made when any doctor becomes a doctor. I didn't do this. I, I, we, we do, we do a course on health and spirituality and we talk about Hippocrates and, um, the Hippocratic Oath in this relationship. But again, we, the science of today takes what it wants from that past and pushes the other way. It begins, the Hippocratic Oath begins with a dedication to the gods. And it concludes with saying, if the medic, if the doctor facilitates with virtue all that's being asked to produce healing, then the, the, the healing will take place. But if the virtue of the doctor goes down or doesn't follow the code, then they become subject to the same disease themselves. Now, of course, that's not part of the Hippocratic Oath of today that's taken out. Another thing in the Hippocratic Oath was that you should never, ever charge to teach the medicine. It was a, a series of disciple to master. Master to disciple. Yeah, master to disciple. Sometimes back and forth. <laughs> of course, that medical model is, you know, medical school is very expensive. So we took what we wanted and pushed the other stuff away and said it wasn't worthy. But unfortunately, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. But, but unfortunately, and we say, science may say, we don't know everything, but we know enough. Now, the point that, that I want to get to in this is, to be scientific, one has to take in all of the data. Not just the data that I'm expecting, or the data that I'm wanting, or the data that I can use to make money but all of the data, all of the potential information to be scientific. That's the very nature of the scientific method, to take in all of the information. But in, in the actuality, the scientific method is not being pulled through that way. For instance, in the origins of matter, in the origins of life, the science says, the scientist says, we will take in all the data, but first we have to agree and remove the idea of spiritual forces or that there is a God. Move that away, and now let's look at all of the data. That is completely unscientific. Even if the, the scientist doesn't believe in, in spiritual elements, to say, I'm going to take in all of the data except the possibility that there's a spiritual, there's a dimension that I cannot perceive. It's the same thing as saying that the germs don't exist because I don't have the faculty to perceive them. The consciousness is absolutely necessary, so much so that now science is starting to even doubt that consciousness is even real, meaning consciousness is seen as a chemical reaction inside of our brains. That we believe that we're conscious, but in reality we're not. And when the brain dies, consciousness is gone. Only someone who never really experiences their awake consciousness could possibly... Consciousness. Oh, 
talk and it with us from and to do it continually benefits that happen in 10 or 20 possible detriments it's because we're not seeing the totality of what's happening and we think if we just can affect this one thing everything else will be okay well science says then well just fix this one thing and then we'll give you a drug for the other thing and then the, the other thing and then the other thing except you can't take them together so oh, in time maybe you can't have health or happiness but you've spent a lot of money <laughs> and most of the research in science is not to produce new marvelous drugs it's to tweak a particle or an atom or a molecule and create a new patent for a drug that does the same thing. How many times have you heard, oh, if you've used this and it doesn't work, try this. And then ask your doctor. They want you to demand from the doctor to tell you, I need this drug because I saw the commercial and it says it, it's going to help me. Without beginning first with this, trying to, to create harmony and balance inside of ourselves peace inside of ourselves. That is the foundation of health and well-being. Just like the, the negative consequence of taking a particle from a whole and multiplying it, psychologically we do the same thing. We might have an element of fear and it gets in the mind and then we multiply it. We separate it from the reality of what's taking place and say, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Psychologically, we're doing the same thing. Because we are scientists of some kind, whether we're intentionally carrying out experiments or not, our life is more or less an experiment. And so there's always been faculties and means to observe and penetrate into the truth that has the power to transform. For instance, Galileo proposed that the earth is not the center of the universe. And for this, in time, he soon he was excommunicated and, and, and um, house, arrest. house arrest for the rest of his life. And only, only um, sometime in the 1960s did the church come out and say, okay, um, Galileo was correct. But what was interesting, interesting is how he came about the truth, he, how he explained his observation is phenomenon. It had to do with, I think, the moons of Jupiter and, and observing what appeared to be a particle or a, of the moon not going around us, but going around the other planet. And what was very interesting, I was at a at the science center with one of my children many, many years ago and his teacher, and when there was talking about uh, science and Galileo and how it was discovered, how he proved that we, that the earth was not the center of the universe and that we revolved around something else, the sun. And the teacher said, he pulled me aside, he goes, you know, the way that he proved it, now we know, isn't true. He could not actually get to the, to the, the, um, conclusion that he had. And I said, oh, yeah. And he goes, so you know what that means, right? And I was like, yeah, I absolutely know what that means. Thinking, yeah, he has a, an ability to transcend physical reality and perceive things in a totality that the senses weren't able to do. So therefore, he, he had to make up ways to be able to translate or communicate what he was capturing with his consciousness to people who did not perceive with their consciousness. So Jeff's thinking, wow, Ziggy's what? teacher. He, he understands it. that there's more than that. And he says, so, so you know what that means? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, 
He lied. And Thomas is like, no, that's not what it means. <laughs> so you see, it's very interesting that we have a point of view, and then we surround that point of view with our thoughts and feelings continually. Our desire, or our, our observations push us to believe or disbelieve what we want. How many times have we sought the truth and we found exactly what we were looking for? I knew it. That's telling us that we're not actually looking with an open consciousness. We're suppressing certain data and suppressing the ability of our consciousness to perceive things because our directed attention limits our capacity to see. And if we're not able to perceive inside of ourselves, we're not going to be fundamentally transformed. And so we are in a world of so many sicknesses, so many sicknesses. Science says, look, we've healed you from this or from that but not sickness itself. We've replaced sicknesses. We've replaced science with science. As I say, the question was, did the science change? Recently, you've probably heard that. Oh, did the science change? No, the science didn't change. We just eventually came around to taking in more information. The problem is not that more information can be taken in, the problem is that we react empirically over the information that we have. And we've just went through a great, great undertaking of that. And that is exactly the same way that the ego, the I, the self, makes empirical this point of view, this idea, this concept of myself, or this concept of somebody else. And we limit our capacity to perceive beyond our identity or what we identify as the objective. Subject, object, location. To maintain that always is our objective. That opens us up to perceiving beyond what I know is true. Now, in conclusion, the relationship of religion. And now religion may have a negative taste for us to say that. And again, we go back to the relationship that religion really is about connecting to our source. It's the same thing in the East, which, which they call yoga, which means union. It comes from the word yug or yoke, which is to yoke together, like the, the the animals that were pulling a cart, yoked together. Yoga is union. Religion is reunion. They both mean the same thing, to connect, to unify myself as a consciousness, as we said last week, the psyche with the logos. The observer with the truth. And in doing that, the impact is remarkable. Why is there religion? Science will say it's because people didn't understand. They didn't, they didn't understand, so they made up things. They believe things. But there's always been an exterior exoteric teaching, a mesoteric, and what Gnosis offers is the esoteric or the inner teaching. In the exoteric, people would believe as deities and gods, as controlling faculties outside of themselves. Because in order to, to understand the truth, one has to abstract one's consciousness beyond to perceive those deities as they are. Otherwise, exoterically, we just believe them as something outside of ourselves. When in truth, the esoteric reality is that those gods, those divinities, that exist outside of ourselves simultaneously exist as part of our own consciousness. One of the prime axioms 
of the alchemical, which is the precursor of science, faculty is as above, so below. Or the doorway of the Temple of Delphi said, as we said last week, human, know yourself and you will know the universe and its gods. Because what is outside of us absolutely has to exist inside of us, which means what's inside of me also exists outside of me, which means whatever terrible, wonderful, magical, horrible thing that may be in the world, the reason it's there is because it also exists inside of myself. And the key to the, the scientific method of the Gnostic is not to find things outside of ourselves, but to find them inside of ourselves. Because that means that I can then understand it, control it, remove it, and be free from it. The reason we're not free from suffering, the reason we're not free from sickness and old age and disease is because the roots of those things are in our psyche, in our consciousness. And no matter what we do outside of ourselves to remove suffering, if we don't find the origin and the cause inside of ourselves, we'll be just like a dog chasing our tail eternally. Which is because we exist in the fifth dimension, which is the realm of eternity. We Most people believe in this eternal nature of the soul, but to believe is different than to be conscious of it. To believe means that I'm following, chasing eternally this idea that I am eternal and never actually perceiving it, never actually allowing it to be conscious. So to believe in God, to believe in heaven, to believe in hell, to believe in extraterrestrials, to believe in multiple dimensions, only has a very, very relative effect as opposed to being conscious of that. And that's why Galileo was prepared to die for his beliefs, but for what he knew. Gnostics, mystics, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews, throughout time were willing to die for their beliefs because they knew this was just a part of a total reality. And to live in a state that is eternal, to be conscious of ourselves as eternal beings, then we wouldn't suffer as much as we did with a negative thought or a negative word or a painful experience, because it's just a small fraction of the totality of what reality is. Believing that is not going to change. Observing it outside and inside of myself allows me the possibility of totally freeing myself from that, transforming, which is what the Buddha did. You've probably heard that the Buddha achieved realization, self-realization. One thing is to believe something. Another is to realize it, to actualize it inside of ourselves. Because if it exists outside of us, it exists inside of us. The capacity to know all time, space, and dimension outside means that I can know it inside of myself. And that is the integration of what we call wisdom, is the power to see, to reunite the essence of who you are with where you came from and where you're going. To, to bridge the gap between the creation and the creator. Not as a bearded old man that sits in the sky throwing thunderbolts, but as a superior expanded state of truth and consciousness of which we are just a fraction of. But as we come to know that fraction, we have the capacity of knowing more and more and more. And it goes beyond anything we could ever imagine. 
And this is what the Buddha found. I'm not going to go into to the, the whole story, but he began to perceive suffering in the world and dedicated himself to liberating it because he found suffering inside of himself like he found it in the world. And once he got the technique, which we teach over time, the technique to liberate the self from, con from suffering, which is why religion has always been a part of the human experience, not because it was a belief system that we didn't know better. It's because it has a profound impact. It's the only thing that can profoundly impact the consciousness because we are part of this great system. And when we come to know that we are part of it and we have a purpose, we have the capacity to feel fulfilled in our purpose instead of gratified or satisfied in an action or dissatisfied. But to be fulfilled is to feel our purpose and to know it. And not only to be willing to kill for it, like an idea that religions have fought for forever exteriorly, but to be willing to die for it. Because I know that it's the truth and there is no way that I can not say it's the truth. So the Buddha, realizing that the suffering existed, Four Noble Truths, he began to sit down and penetrate. Wisdom, viz, comes from Vishnu, to penetrate, to see, vision, and dom, dominion, to see with power, to sit with power. The Sanskrit term is, is buddhi, which is wisdom, which is the essence of what the Buddha is, is actualized wisdom, which is illumination that he sat himself at the base of what is known as the Bodhi tree and penetrated inside of himself, inside, to every thought, every feeling, every pain, every suffering, every joy, every sadness, and dissected it with his consciousness to find the origin, the truth. And in the end, he found that everything is empty. Everything is a component of no thing, not nothing, but no thing because it's a totality and it is no one thing because it's everything. And upon penetrating, he got to what he called the root of all matter, which he called the kalapa, which is an eight-parted particle. He said that to penetrate beyond that would be to go beyond matter itself. But what he found and totally profoundly impacted him at the very, this subatomic particle, we can call it, when he observed it in the depths of his own consciousness, it was fluctuating and vibrating at such a speed. He said that at the point of the blink of an eye, it had transformed or changed a trillion times. That the very root of what we call matter is completely changing. Not as only everything changing in the known experience, but the very root and orange or origin of everything at the subatomic level is changing profoundly. And so the conclusion that was so obvious that there is no need to identify or grasp or cling to anything because it's destined to change and the, that when it changes, it will produce suffering. No matter how much we love or desire something, when it goes, we will feel the sadness. No matter how terrible something is, when it comes, it's going to produce suffering. But it will go. It will go as long as we don't isolate it and multiply it inside of our psyche over and over again not seeing the unforeseen circumstances and consequences of doing that because we're focused on this idea that I'm, I have to, to, to worry, 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 or something bad's going to happen. Something bad will happen because I'm worrying. It's inevitable. We're creating the effect that we may or may not want 
but with the circumstances and the consequences that I cannot see because I'm identified with the thing that I'm focused on. Divide the attention like we're all doing right now. Subject, object, location. So in seeing that, it facilitated the explosion of illumination inside of him and he achieved total self-realization. And that is why we're still talking about him 2,500 years later. Because he achieved through self-observation the root of the suffering and liberated it inside of himself. And through induction, his state, his dialogues, his mission, his transmission, continually people have been receiving truth and freeing themselves from suffering. And this is in all the different religions and different variations. This is what why these things are still there. We might have lost the core, the reason, or the way to experience it, which Gnosis brings back. Gnosis comes up again and again through different religions to show how to perceive inside of ourselves simultaneously to free ourselves. The Gnosis of Buddhism, the Gnosis of, Gnosis of Christianity, the Gnosis of Science, Alchemy, the gnosis, the element that transforms. Now, flash forward 2,500 years. In Berkeley, Berkeley, California, a certain scientist that received the Nobel Prize for creating what is called a bubble chamber, means by which we cannot see atoms, but we found ways to create an environment so we can see the reaction of atoms and smash things together. Our science is built upon destroying things. We separate elements of the atom to facilitate destruction, and then we watch what happens. And then we say, that's where life, that's what, how we learn about life, by killing things. It's, it's an absurd way of going about it, but it's, it has its, its means. As science says, we don't know everything, but we know enough. For instance, we know that 90% of matter is composed of dark matter that we cannot see, but we can see the effect of it. But yet we know enough. That's not necessary. To do what we need to do, we know. That's like a dog saying, this ball is all I need. That's all I need to know about reality is this ball, and I'm going to follow it all the way. Not realizing that there's so much more to what's happening. Now, what happened is uh, several monks heard about this, uh, this discovery, the Nobel Prize, uh, this bubble chamber where they have like a, a liquid, a, an oil, where they can perceive the elements as they separate them. And they found that they went to the, the smallest, smallest particle that they could derive, to, to break apart an atom, that if they broke any further, it would cease to be matter. And they found that that particle vibrates, oscillates, fluctuates at one to the, I think it's 18th power or 18th, 18 zeros within a second. Essentially the same thing that the Buddha found. And also that it was composed of. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't, I don't know about that. But that, but it, that it was the, the particles of reality were moving continually at a rate that was beyond, uh, capacity to understand. These monks go and they go to see the scientist and they find him, the glasses and smoking a pipe, relatively unchanged in a college of people that were relatively unchanged in a world of people that are relatively unchanged. Yet we know that's how matter operates, but we don't know it inside of ourselves. And if we don't know it, if we're not conscious of it inside of ourselves, the transformation cannot take place. We're asleep and suffering. No matter how many things have been proven scientifically, exteriorly, we still suffer. 
suffering has been with us as long as we've been alive. But more importantly, a path to liberate from suffering has also existed because there's always been divine scientists that have worked to remove the symptoms of suffering, but the course of suffering itself. And this is why religion has always been here, a means to connect. And if the data to know realities goes beyond physical to the spiritual, and if there's a spiritual reality, it behooves us to come to understand what it's there for and, and what it's doing. And more so, what is my purpose in relation to that? Otherwise, the life that we live will not produce fulfillment. We thank you for spending these moments with us, being present, sharing your attention, and we'll be in connection with you if you wish to continue here. Um, but it's an opportunity, especially for those that have maybe this is the first time you've been here to ask a question or share a comment. There's a, quite a few of us, so we want to try to make it brief so that anyone that wants to, to speak can. And if those that need to leave right now, that's fine. We'll, we'll be here in the future and we can communicate via email or other means.